Um, uh, thank you all so much for having me. Um, and thanks particularly to um, Lizzie, Marsha, and David for setting this up. Um, Timmy, you described this as the main event. Um, I, it's absolutely terrifying to be a main event if you have just been preceded by Kathy Kelly, who just gave a wonderful talk. So I hope that I will not entirely ruin the mood um, but but maybe we can we can talk about some history. Um, I'm going to attempt an act of technological proficiency, and I'm going to try to share my screen. Uh, in my experience, this is going to look weird at first, and then we will fix it, and then it won't look weird. So let's see what happens. Okay, that's looking weird, but I think that looks okay. Yes, thumbs up if you, yeah, something like that. Okay, I'm a historian, so I'm going to start with the past. Uh, some, some of you may remember this. Uh, in 2000, a young candidate for the Republican candidate for the presidency, a governor, George W. Bush, was trying to convince the country that he should be president. Uh, and he got quizzed by a journalist who just sort of, as like a series of gotcha questions, asked him to name a number of foreign leaders whose countries had been prominent in the news, and Bush could name none of them. And so it was thought that perhaps he's a little weak on foreign policy. Uh, and Bush got very nervous about this. So he gave a speech at the Ronald Reagan Library, his first foreign policy speech that was kind of to set the, the tone um, for, for who he was as a, as a foreign policy intellectual. And he you know, debuted a few things, you know, firmer hand in Russia, uh, more trade with Japan, that kind of thing. But then he got to the point uh, which is how he saw the country. And, and he put it like this, America has never been an empire. We may be the only great power in history that has had a chance and refused. So here's a young and uh, kind of unsure of himself candidate grasping for the soul of his own candidacy in the realm of foreign policy and, and for the heart of, of you know, what America's presence in the world means. And he decides that it's anti-imperial. And that's not I think an unusual decision. In fact, there's a sort of long history of presidents throughout the 20th century saying some version of this, making some version of a claim that the United States has never been an empire, the United States covets no territory, the United States has no aspirations uh, for the uh, lands of its neighbors. I mean, it really just goes on. You can almost go through every president in the 20th century and into the 21st and get some version of this. It's, it's sort of embarrassingly monotonous. We covet no territory, we covet no territory. And when you hear this from so many different presidents across the aisle, it's sort of a hallowed bipartisan presidential tradition, you start to wonder, why are they all saying this? And one possibility, in fact, a good possibility, maybe it's true. Maybe they're just all saying it because it's true. But the other possibility is, this is a, the lady doth protest too much methinks situation, that there's a kind of performance being given, a uh, sort of ritualistic incantation as a way of warding off an uncomfortable truce, which is that in many ways, the United States is an empire. And I would like to explore that second possibility with you. Uh, look, I'm a historian. So when presidents, as some of them do, make the uh, historical version of the claim as Bush's version is here, it's flatly wrong. It's really hard as a historian to entertain the idea that the United States historically hasn't been an empire for some fairly straightforward reasons, which I will just sketch out. The first is that the country's predecessor colonies began as, well, as colonies, uh, as groups of colonists who were coming from England and were coming into uh, lands owned by native peoples, in this case, the pilgrims landing at the, in the Wampanoag Confederacy, uh, and I mean, it was firmly understood that what was going on here was the implantation of British empire on indigenous lands. One version of the historical claim we make is that we say that these people, these colonists or colonizers, uh, then threw off the shackles of empire when they staged a revolution. And that's kind of true. Uh, if you think about uh, empire as being an imperial relationship between Britain and the new United States, that was severed. But if you think about the relationship between these colonists and native people, that remained entirely intact. And you can think, in fact, of the United States as a kind of successor empire to the British Empire in North America. This is a map I made 
um, of the United States. We usually think of the United States, like its name says, as a union of states, all kind of joined together, self-governing. Um, but in fact, from day one uh, and until the present day and in every day in between, the United States has been not just a union of states, but an amalgam of states and territories. Uh, and a lot of those territories, despite the kind of national mythology about them being quickly upgraded to states, uh, have been territories for decades, uh, for a very long time in their history. And the reason is not because they've been empty of people just waiting for settlers to come in and establish a government. Uh, it's because of who lived there, and particularly indigenous people uh, living there. And the fact the states that it took the longest, or the territories that took the longest to become states, were those where most native people lived or had been uh, pushed uh, so that they lived there. Um, the United States, by its own count, uh, over the course of the late 18th and 19th century, uh, fought more than 1,500 military engagements with indigenous adversaries, mainly in the territories. And I'm sort of taken by this statue, which used to be on the steps of the US Capitol, just showing a man modeled on Daniel Boone wrestling uh, with, uh, with, an, with an Indian, with an indigenous man. Uh, this was kind of what the country was about in a very forthright sort of way. Uh, this Daniel Boone figure was you know, on the steps of the Capitol as a sort of founding father. Um, and this is a history that's still with us, uh, still very much with us. Um, the United States has uh, within its borders about, uh, I think it's 574 federally recognized uh, tribal nations. Uh, and if you take all the Indian reservations in the United States and mash them together, you're talking about a land area roughly the size of Idaho. And it's not even just that. Uh, very quickly after um, the United States expanded its borders through a series of wars, purchases, and indigenous dispossessions uh, to the point where it filled out sort of this familiar profile, uh, it kept expanding. In fact, this map that we're used to, that we sort of call to mind when we think about how the United States looked, this map only corresponds to the country's borders for three years. There's only three years of US history where that's the map, 1854 to 1857, if you're curious. And the reason is that very quickly, oops, sorry, uh, excuse me, I double slides, that very quickly after the United States filled out that familiar shape in 1854, uh, it started expanding overseas. Uh, first, by taking a series of uninhabited uh, islands known as the Guano Islands for their nitrate-rich fertilizer that they contained uh, in the Pacific and the Caribbean. Here's a map I made of them. Uh, when I say a series of them, that's actually something of an understatement. The United States claimed nearly 100 of these over the course of the 19th century. Uh, very quickly, it took the uh, inhabited and, and enormous uh, uh, territory of Alaska in the end of the 19th century, the United States intervened in a war that Spain with, was fighting uh, with its colonies. Uh, and instead of, at the end of the war, freeing the colonies at a, at a, as it had promised the uh, anti-Spanish rebels, it instead became a successor empire to Spain, annexing the Spanish colonies of the Philippines, Puerto Rico, and Guam, and taking in a sort of fit of imperial enthusiasm, the non-Spanish lands of Hawaii and American Samoa and occupying Cuba at the same time. By the middle of the 20th century, this is what the United States looked like. Um, this is just, it, this map just shows every area as sort of flatly black, so you don't see sovereignty distinctions within um, you know, the United States. You don't see all the um, uh, native reservations. Uh, but what you do see is all of the land, and all of the land shown in a way you don't always see it, which is to scale at an equal area projection, all of the land that the United States has claimed, I mean, you wanna say beyond its borders, but in fact, these are the borders of the United States. The part, the, 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 the thing that I usually have been trained to call the United States, that familiar shape. Uh, in fact, when you look at this map, you can see is only part of the United States. It's a big part, it's a privileged part, uh, it's a populous part, but it's not the whole of the country because uh, the US Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, the Philippines at that point had been a US colony and it's enormous, American Samoa, Guam, Alaska, and a number of these uninhabited islands that the United States still maintain claims over, they were all also part of the United States. When you look at it like that, it becomes hard to understand how historically you could make the claim that the United States has not been an empire. What was the Philippines, if not a colony? Um, but thinking about the kind of forward-looking version of this claim, 
uh, the United States isn't an empire or, or no longer covets territory, well, what would we think of that? I think that also is a hard claim to uh, fully uh, buy. And it's a little complicated because the United States doesn't go on sort of territory acquiring binges in the way that it used to in the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century. Uh, but it does have other forms of power, some territorial, some non, uh, that mark it as distinct from other countries. It is not really a nation among nations. It is a very special kind of country and one that I think it wouldn't be crazy to identify as an empire. One thing that we can point to is something that Kathy Kelly already mentioned. Those 800, as far as we can tell, military bases. Here's a map I made of them. It's a little hard because uh, when the bases are very next to each other or are close next to each other, you just see one dot or a squiggle, but often you know, some of those dots mean you know, dozens of bases. Um, but what, I, what you can see in this map is that the United States has military bases all over the planet. It is hard to be a country that doesn't either have a US military base in it or isn't in some ways surrounded and potentially menaced by the US military base. Now, this isn't the same kind of large colonial claims with large amounts of land. If you mash all of the base sites together, we're talking about a land area roughly the size of Houston. Uh, but nevertheless, these are incredibly important uh, for the countries where the bases are stationed. It is impossible not to have to contemplate the fact uh, that if you live in Japan, for example, that there have been military bases all over Japan uh, since World War II. It's not just these sort of little specks of semi-sovereignty that the United States has all over the planet. Uh, it's also other forms of power, some strictly economic that don't really show up on most maps. Its corporations have spread out comfortably all over the planet. Uh, it has a kind of control over global commerce and finance uh, that is not just unrivaled, but sort of out beyond its, its own size as a country. Um, it, it, it has a kind of commanding power at institutions like the World Bank and the IMF that, that is even disproportionate uh, to how much of the global economy it controls. And then, and this is also something that doesn't quite show up on a map because it's an action, not a border, the United States has, is just constantly in a state of war or if you don't want to call it war, semi-war or policing, whatever. The point is that the United States is sending troops and those, and, and you know, not, not just sort of peacetime sort of aid troops, but is sending troops for the purposes of violence all over the map, kind of all the time. So the Congressional Research uh, Service produced a list of everywhere that the United States, that US, uh, the military has been deployed. Uh, well, I'll just show you since the end of the Cold War, um, so not just deployed in, in peacetime, but, but deployed, uh, you, know, you know, to fight or to be prepared to fight. And so I'm just going to show you the list of um, all of those deployments. Uh, so, you know, all of those things that, you know, in a sort of normal way of looking at it would be called wars uh, that the United States has been fought. Some of them are quite small, uh, but nevertheless, you'll see a sort of constant stream of them. Uh, so this is from the end of the Cold War. It only goes up to 2016. So this is the list. No, actually, I'm sorry, this isn't the list because it wouldn't all fit on a page. This is just to 1996, four. Each one of these, they're very small, but each one of these line breaks is a separate deployment. Macedonia, Iraq, Iraq, Somalia, Bosnia. There's a lot of them. Okay, let's move forward. Well, now we're into 96, but just into 99. Bosnia, Yugoslavia, Bosnia, Cambodia, Sierra Leone. Okay, well, now we're into 2001. My God, there's just even more of them. East Timor, uh, Yugoslavia again, Bosnia again, East Timor again, uh, Sierra Leone again. They just keep coming. This, is the, this gets you up to 2003. This is the list up to 2007. This is to 2011, to 2013, to th 2014, 2015. 2016. And if you were to see the list up to the present, it would just be an equally long list, paragraph after paragraph, each representing, I don't know exactly what to call it, each, each representing a military incursion, each representing a time when the United States is willing to and is using force uh, in foreign countries. And then beyond all that, there's this just sort of diffuse sense in which the United States expects to be not a country among countries, not a nation among nations, but to sit 
as President Biden put it frequently, at the head of the table of international affairs, to be consulted on all matters, just as a, as a sort of matter of fact, that that's the natural place of the United States. And what's amazing is that that can be a kind of widely accepted understanding within the United States, that Biden could campaign on this, restoring to the United, the United States to the head of the table, to the apex of an international hierarchy, in which the United States sits atop, in some ways, the rest of the world. Um, I've been asked to talk about the, the costs of empire, and I, and I haven't done that yet. I've just talked about the fact of it and all the many forms that it could take, and I'm leaving out a number of them. Maybe we can talk about them in Q&A if you'd like. Um, but, but I would like to talk about the costs. When we talk about the costs of this empire of the United States, usually the first thing that gets said when we talk about it in the United States is the cost to US service members. And those have been extensive. If you total up all the US deaths from post 9-11 wars, we're talking about 15,000 people. Now, interestingly, the majority of those deaths have not even been to US service members. They've been to rather US military contractors. More of those have died than official, official uh, uniform service members. But nevertheless, putting those two categories together, we're talking about 15,000 people, which of course, I mean, it's 15,000 too many. Um, and you can imagine uh, the pain uh, of having one of these people be someone you know and someone you love. Um, we can also tally it up, and this is how we often do it, in terms of just how much money has been spent on this. Eight trillion dollars, as far as we can tell, which is an absolute, I just, you know, just typing out all those zeros, I, I got to the point where I thought, surely this is too many zeros, but it was not too many zeros. That's what eight trillion dollars looks like. And it is just kind of gobsmacking to think, what if we hadn't spent it on that? The United States had $8 trillion to spend and this is what it spent it on? That was a terrible use of money. That's how we normally talk about the costs of empire. In the costs in, you know, as some people say, blood and treasure. But there are other costs and I think costs worth discussing. One is what this has done to the character of the United States. Because if you're spending $8 trillion on warfare, it's not like all of it just happens overseas. There is a kind of blowback, a militarization of US society that we're dealing with, the, you know, the consequences of which we deal with on a daily basis as our police start to look more and more like occupying forces. Uh, we deal with it, and it turns out that educate, or training an enormous number of people to regard foreigners as some kind of enemy that could be killed, arming them, training them how to use all those weapons, subjecting them to possibly a number of traumas, and then just kind of letting them go has some serious consequences back for the United States at home. Uh, it's not entirely an accident that the largest uh, act of domestic terrorism uh, in, in, in recent US history, uh, the Oklahoma City bombing was committed by two army veterans. It is not entirely an accident that of the uh, people who stormed uh, the Capitol on January 6, disproportionately they've been service members and vets, and if not have participated in the kind of military culture as you know, aspirational uh, members of it, uh, who, who deck themselves out in camouflage and can and do acquire the kinds of weapons that we normally would think of as being appropriate for militaries, but wildly inappropriate for just walking around and nevertheless that such weapons uh, suffuse the United States. Those are all things we can say, but I think actually the most important thing to point out is that the costs of empire are not mainly borne by the United States. In fact, there's something narcissistic about asking within the United States, what are the costs of empire? And asking what are the costs for the imperialist country. Um, I think in some ways you're, you're sort of participating in the same imperial sense of which places matter and which places don't, whose lives matter and whose lives don't. Uh, if we start to ask, ask not just, you know, how many US lives have been lost in the United States post 9-11 wars and how many total lives have been lost, we're looking at a much larger number, uh, around a million lives lost, which is about 60 non-US deaths for every US death. That figure itself, which is kind of, I mean, a 60 to one death ratio just gives you a sense of what empire looks like. It's in a remarkable asymmetry of power. 
Um, and that number itself is, is sort of a vast understatement because that's just a count of uh, direct deaths in major war zones. And that doesn't count uh, the many people who have died as a result of uh, infrastructure like water and sewage and electricity uh, being bombed out, uh, who've been forced to dislocate and you know have acquired diseases as a result. Uh, in fact, it's almost impossible to toll up all of the lives lost and uh, disrupted and dislocated by these wars. And that's part of the problem too, is just a, a sort of blithe sense that from the United States, uh, the consequences of this, first of all, are quite obviously disproportionately borne by people outside of the United States and kind of exist within the United States nebulously, uncountably. It's very hard to get your head around it. And I think that itself is a sort of fact about empire and a consequence of empire. Um, the asymmetry of costs uh, is part of what allows the United States to comfortably and confidently and, and non-controversially maintain this enormous infrastructure of force projection. Kathy Kelly was right to note the 800, as far as we can tell, uh, bases in US territories and foreign countries uh, that you know just never come up. Like it's not the kind of thing that I mean, sorry, it's not that they never come up. We're talking about it now, and I'm very glad we are. But uh, if you listen to a presidential debate, uh, this is not the kind of thing that anyone will mention. In fact, the last presidential debates we had between Biden and Trump, no one even mentioned the fact that the United States was at war. That was not mentioned once in any of the debates because this kind of force projection just seems, you know, from the perspective of the United States, natural. It's just a form of policing. Uh, and that you know, endows in the United States a habit of thinking of global problems, not as problems to be solved by help, uh, but as security threats requiring military responses. One of the government agencies that is actually most thoughtful about climate change is the U.S. military, and the U.S. military is thoughtful about it because it, you know, runs all scenarios where it imagines all kinds of security threats to the United States uh, that might emanate from uh, the dislocations of, uh, you know, that, that come with climate change, which I guess is true. Uh, it is true that climate change is gonna create all kinds of political problems, but it is absolutely terrifying to me that the agency of the United States that's thinking the most carefully about what climate change is gonna do to the planet is an agency that is primarily concerned with neutralizing threats. What would it look like if that $8 trillion were spent on helping people in need and understanding climate change as ultimately a situation that requires help, not just threat suppression. Uh, and that I think is the, you know, one of the largest costs of empire is that we now have a global governance system that is hierarchical. The United States is indeed, as Joe Biden has, has wished, uh, at the head of the table. And, and so we have a superpower that is central to global decision-making and yet uh, is not responsible in that's in a larger sense to a global public, uh, but is rather concerned with, you know, its own, you know, very narrowly construed interests, uh, interests which it often expresses as security uh, at a moment of profound peril. There are things to be scared of in the world today. A lot of them have to do with the changing climate. There are things to be scared about today. The pandemic is an absolutely terrifying thing. And the United States has a kind of architecture and infrastructure of fear and responding to fear and the fears that it responds to are not the ones we need to be worried about. And so much of the global conversation, just because of the fact of empire, the stark asymmetry of power is taken up uh, with the concerns of the United States, a country that has not demonstrated uh, an ability to use its massive resources uh, for truly collective projects. So that I think uh, is one of the scariest costs of empire. And um, I thank you for your time in this, and, and perhaps we'll, we'll talk in Q&A if you'd like. I'm going to sh stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Daniel. I'm going to add Nasha here to the spotlight. Um, she'll be moderating the Q&A. Hey guys, thank you so much for that, Daniel. Um, and yeah, I'm gonna start the Q&A. So if you guys have any questions, please drop it uh, in the chat. Um, I will go ahead and start. Um, first and foremost, Daniel, uh, can you please discuss the blockade of Cuba as an example of empire? Why has Biden not moved to liberalize following Obama's policy? 
Yeah, I mean, so the the ins and outs of it, I, I don't have anything interesting to say, mainly because there's not, I don't, I don't know a lot about it. But, um, you know, the United States has, it's, it's not just Cuba, uh, it, it has played this game or engaged in this uh, practice of sanctioning regimes that it deems sort of problematic. And on the one hand, I mean, you could argue that, you know, perhaps refusing to trade uh, with a regime is is a far better way of dealing with your disapproval of it than than bombing it. Um, but the United States has it's not just the United States alone. It's its ability to control sort of global flows of things, and and it's it's how active its corporations are, such that when the United States refuses to with sanctions another country by by sort of refusing to trade with it, uh, it can cause enormous deaths, as it did to Iraq before the Iraq War. Uh, the, I mean, we don't talk enough about the sort of slow violence of the sanctions regime on Iraq uh, that preceded the, the hot violence of the Iraq War and all the disruption that followed it. Uh, and that just has to do with the absolute centrality of the United States in the global economy and, and its ability to do something that other countries can't do, which is not just to say, you know, we don't want to participate in, in, in your government and we don't want to sort of trade with you, uh, but but the United States has an ability to lock, you know, ice other countries out uh, to the point where uh, it becomes an existential crisis for them. Um, and and it, there's also another component of this where it, um, uh, if the United States ices you out from arms sales, uh, it often floods your uh, rivals with arms sales. Uh, that creates a sort of, you know, I mean, because the United States sort of just has this lock on, on global arms sales, um, that can create uh, both a lot of instability and a lot of security, security problems uh, for those regimes. Thank you so much. Um, so we have another question. Uh, how do we get media outlets to begin to address the truth of empire? Uh, we are an empire and as such, uh, we are a bully on the international stage. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I've been trying to beat my head against that problem myself. Um, and one question I've had, I just, and I mean it as a genuine question and then, you know, folks might have an answer is, is, is about the E word. There is such a uh, sensitivity about that. And you can see from all these presidents, you know, we're never an empire, we never want to be an empire. Uh, there, there's such a sensitivity about that, that I, I have myself not been sure whether more is achieved uh, by just insisting, you know, insistently using the E word, naming it for what it is, or by just laying out the case and saying, you know, if you want to call it empire, that's fine. You don't want to call it empire. It's a word. Uh, we can reserve that word for countries with colonies if you want to be a stickler about it. But but look at these maps. Look at the military bases. Like you have to acknowledge that that's something. Um, so uh, so that's one question I have. But you know, my general sense is that this is just an eighteen wheel truck. That you know, it, it's there's no one thing that we can do. But there's a lot of effort and a lot of persistent effort and just sort of. You know the work of organizing, the work of writing, the work of reading um, that it's just going to take to sort of de-imperialize the mindsets of, or at least the mindset of the voting public in the United States. Thank you so much. Uh, so we have a question from Trina. Uh, our dad was interested in the end of empire, the idea that we have made so many enemies abroad and spend so much of our wealth that we are inevitably struggling and collapsing, at least internally. Uh, is that similar to past failed empires? Uh, is the US on the verge of being a failed empire? Yeah, I mean, what is a successful empire, right? Like, are we, I mean, it's it's not like I'm rooting for the empire's success. It's, that's a way that we have of talking sometimes. And, and you know, you can, we can sort of slip into the United States as an empire rhetorical mode. And then, you know, are we Rome, you know, be, you know is, is often the next question asked. And it does seem to be the case that the material uh, underpinnings of the United States hegemonic power, its predominance in the world are slipping. Uh, particularly slipping um, with respect to China. Uh, and what that's going to mean, I don't know, or when the sort of final adjustment of that is going to happen. I mean, you know, I think the happy version is that this is a, a moment when the United States isn't going to be a failed empire, but a successful normal country. Um, if, if, we, if we don't regard empire as a success term, we could welcome what uh, people in the interwar period called, although unfortunately we often mock, a return to normalcy. Uh, after World War One, there was a lot of interest in returning to the United States to not having a sort of 
fully global uh, power projection. And, and we now kind of look back on that, at least my high school history teachers did and, and said, oh, those, those jerks wanted to return to normalcy. You know, they, they should have known Hitler was coming. Uh, but, you know, I mean, looking back on that now, you just think, wow, what a great moment. Like, what a great slogan for a country, return to normalcy. So um, is the United States a like slipping in terms of its, its place in the power rankings? Probably. Uh, it's pretty sticky, though. So, I mean, it, it has a lot, like, those military bases just don't go away overnight. Uh, the, it's other forms of power and privilege that it has uh, could be sticky in the same way. Um, and and I, I, the thing I'm most worried about is um, a kind of bumpy ride down uh, and a lot of lashing out and and sort of exertion of force as a as a you know um, last resort to to resolve problems that could should be resolved diplomatically. Um, but my hopeful part of this is that, yeah, maybe, you know, like the British Empire once did, we can we can welcome the fact that the United States could uh, grow, its heart could grow many sizes, even if its basic structure shrinks a little bit. Uh, thank you so much for your response. Uh, we have another question from Kerry Hall. Um, in terms of military bases outside of Iraq and Afghanistan, are there any bases the U.S. has withdrawn from in the past 10 to 20 years? Absolutely. Yeah, it's really important to get this, that the unit, that the basing structure has been shifting a lot. And one of the reasons it's been shifting is that uh, the United States gets kicked out of a lot of countries. So these basing agreements are, I mean, the, the caricatured and untrue version would be that the United States just plants its bases in Germany or Japan or South Korea or wherever and, and just refuses to move them. Uh, that's true of Guantanamo Bay, but that is generally not true. Usually the United States has to come to some agreement or not, sorry, usually in almost every case, except for Guantanamo Bay and Cuba, the United States has some agreement with the quote unquote host country, uh, which allows it to do this. And, and often US military bases kick up a lot of local resistance, which is why I think the anti-basing, sort of the global anti-basing movement is one of the most important levers against US power. Uh, and and e even within the US military, I mean, this is a really important thing to say, uh, the mil like generals are not fully committed to a basing structure of this size. Uh, a lot of those bases are there out of inertia, out of you know lo heavy lobbying from military contractors, that kind of thing. Uh, so I think there's a lot of hope, especially if we can finally put a lot of US domestic public pressure on the issue. I think there's a lot of hope that uh, the basing structure could be way smaller uh, than, than it is. And um, I, I'm really taken by this book by uh, David Vine called The United States of War, where he points out just how constantly the United States has been at war, not just, you know, since World War II, but just, you know, since its inception, fighting Indian wars and then, you know, kind of, you know, in the Caribbean and then moving on. And what he points out is that a constant impetus to those wars is the military bases. Because once the bases are there, if they get attacked, then the United States has to counterattack. But also once the bases are there, they just become an invitation to resolve problems with force. And so he suggests that one of the most important ways to um, temper the United States sort of constant at warness uh, would be to roll back the military bases as much as possible. And one, uh, not to go on about this, but one kind of intriguing and hopeful uh, example of this is is a country that's not particularly known for its pacifism and it's not particularly known for getting well getting along well with its neighbors, China, which has one foreign military base and has barely had any international combat uh, in the in the past forty years. Uh, I mean, there's all kinds of violence happening within Chinese borders. I mean, this is not a defense of the Chinese state, uh, but China does not seem to be at all locked in the kind of constant warfare that the United States is, and that may have to do with the fact that it also does not have bases planted everywhere. Thank you so much um, for the response. Um, we have another question from Liz. Um, what are your thoughts on the rising geopolitical tensions with China, especially with Taiwan? Does this reflect your case? And what can we do to avoid the risk of a hot war? war? Sorry. Yeah, I mean, no, I, I think that's the, you know, there's a version of this where uh, China moves on Taiwan and, and U.S. leaders have to kind of decide, you know, if, if how committed they are to being the global superpower, because they've said that, you know, if this happens, the U.S. will uh, scramble the scramble the jets and, and mobilize the troops. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. I'm not sure. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure how much of great depth I have to say on this issue, but um, uh, it strikes me that the the rise in geopolitical power of China, which I'm not sure is to be cheered in its own right, 
uh, may actually be an incredibly useful lever in um, sort of de-imperializing the United States, or at least adjusting the United States to a different global role. Um, and it's not clear to me that that would then mean that China is now in the position that the United States is in. It, it may actually just lead to a more multilateral world. And it's certainly been the case in the last, you know, 40, 50 years that the more multilateral the world has become, uh, the fewer people have died of war. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, and Ashra, I, just to be respectful of, of our speakers, Daniel, we could keep you here till nine o'clock. This, this, group, this group would ask you questions for another hour and a half. Let's take one or two more questions. Sounds good. Uh, thank you so much, Daniel, for continuing to answer my questions. Oh, our it's questions. a pleasure. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to give you one, two more questions, and then we will be done then. Uh, so we have a question from Charles. Um, U.S. even declares its right. Oh, I'm sorry. We have a, hold on. Sorry, that was not a question. Um, we have a question from Mary. Uh, given the risk for future conflicts, wars over new global resources, which are getting more limited, I'm worried that the issue you raised will worsen without trying to project the future. Can you speak on this? Uh, without trying to predict the future, I cannot speak on this. Uh, so, um, yeah, no, I, I, I share that worry. Um, the, the right now, look, there's two ways to look at it, I suppose. Um, one is to notice that, you know, despite all the challenges we face, um, that the world has been getting less violent, uh, over the course of the last century. And, you know, it's hard to say exactly why, but that's really worth celebrating. You know, we should say that and we should you know, do everything we can to possibly continue the trend. Uh, and, and so there's a hopeful version of this, which is that if we keep that going, and especially if we're able to um, sort of impede or block or reform um, the most likely purveyors of violence, and, and the United States is the, is the chief one in the world today, um, that we may see a world where we can imagine struggle over resources and a human struggle uh, that doesn't necessarily lead to armed conflict. Um, I think that's the, the, the most helpful thing. But uh, yeah, every thing I have from looking at the international panel and climate change reports suggests that um, it's going to be a rough, yeah, it's going to be a rough, you know, half half century ahead, and, and certainly after that. Um, and I think that that that's all the more reason reason to to regard with great urgency the task of um, removing violence as a as a sort of solution to a you know a struggle over water or something like that. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, I thank you. Um, I know I, we don't want to waste your time, <laughs> but uh, I will let you go now. Okay. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to be here and and to talk with some of you, even in this weird way that here now is over Zoom. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Daniel. I think this was even more than we actually had hoped for. So. What a, what a fabulous framing in, in, in 21 minutes <laughs> to take us through that broad sweep of history and bring us to the, the present day. Um, thank you so much.